Elden Ring is a mediocre game. I am not in love with Elden Ring at all. I'll admit that it has some great aspects to it, but I'm not gonna be just sucking this game's dick like I've seen so many people do over the past almost two years. It has some major flaws. It's honestly difficult for me to pick up a real starting point. Uh, come on, dude. Who am I? Upper Echelon? <laughs> Alright, let's start with a real review. Hello everyone, this is Mabel HQ, the Pro Gamer, and I'm back with another video for you folks. Today I wanna talk about Elden Ring. You know, that from software game that everyone loves and kills for. The masterpiece amongst masterpieces. The best open world game ever created. The groundbreaking gemstone that redefined an entire genre for generations to come. Yeah, that game. I've been meaning to review this game for a while now, and since there are rumors of the DLC possibly dropping soon wandering about, I think it's the perfect opportunity to do it. So, let's do it! Just a little heads up before we start, I'm sure that by reading the title of the video you can gather that I'm not exactly the biggest Elden Ring fan. I don't really like this game that much, I'm nowhere near as convinced as other people who have made a review on it that it should be called a masterpiece, and I really don't think that it's deserving of all the praise that it gets. So yeah, this review is going to lean towards a rather critical perspective of the game, but before some of you people start to jump into conclusions, thinking that I'm just here to complain about this game because I'm bad at it. I'll have you know that I have finished this game playing it thoroughly from beginning to end without using the summoning bell at least uh, two times. And I consider myself a pretty good Elden Ring player. Pretty good. Pretty good. Pretty good. So I can only hope that you'll hear me out without a prejudice of me not knowing what I'm talking about. And so, with that out of the way, let's begin. Okay, first thing I wanna talk about is the game modes. In Elden Ring, after approximately 30 minutes from starting the game, you get the option to play with an item called the Spirit Calling Bell, which is basically the easy mode. I'm gonna be talking more in detail about this particular item in a moment. Then we have the normal mode, which is uh, playing the game without uh, picking or using uh, the item that I just uh, mentioned. Then there is the new game plus, which is supposed to be the hard mode. You can play in this mode after beating the game once, and it's basically a start over with everything you unlocked on your previous playthrough. And uh, you also get to fight uh, stronger enemies that do more damage and have more health. I say this is uh, supposed to be the hard mode because in reality it doesn't feel like a hard mode, more like an easy mode 2.0, but I'll talk more in detail about this one later as well. And finally we have the New Game Plus 7 mode which is pretty much the same as the one I just talked about, with the only difference being that in order to play this one you need to beat the game 7 times. And in this mode you're gonna be fighting the strongest versions available of all enemies in the game, they're gonna have like 3 times more health than in comparison with regular New Game Plus and they are gonna deal even more damage. Now I'm always down for a challenge and I would have liked to play the New Game Plus 7 difficulty for the footage in this review but I simply don't have the willpower to finish this game 7 times in a row just so I can fight the same enemies and bosses that I previously defeated 6 times earlier but with more health and damage. So instead, for the making and research of this review, I decided to go for a normal playthrough starting from point zero. Anyways, we start the game and we are presented with the, quite the overdramatic opening cutscene that it's supposed to give you a general idea of what the story is going to be about. Oh, rise now, ye tarnished, ye dead, who yet live. The ever brilliant Gold Mask. And Sir Gideon Othnia. The all knowing. Then we take control of the character and we 
can start moving and seeing how the game plays and what every button on your controller or keyboard does. By the way, before you start a game, you go through a character creation menu where you can customize the appearance of your character. And you also get to choose a class that influences the type of attributes and gear that you're gonna start with. The customization part is alright for the most part. I never much cared for this kind of stuff where you choose how your character looks. I prefer having a predefined character with the looks that are connected to the story and whatnot, like uh, Sekiro from Sekiro or William from Neo. The classes on the other hand feel kind of irrelevant uh, because the only difference they make is that you start with an attribute slightly higher than the others and gear that you will most likely end up replacing a couple hours into the game. But in any case, shortly after watching the opening cutscene and taking control of your character, in the most from software of fashions, you are approached by an intimidating opponent that you are most likely not gonna be able to defeat. So you die as a part of a scripted sequence and then weird things happen and you... revive or something? And that's how you are introduced to the open world of Elden Ring. Also, before stepping into the open world, the game provides a small tutorial that teaches you about the combat and stealth mechanics, which I think is a nice detail. I remember playing Bloodborne and not knowing at the beginning why enemies were making loud weird noises after I hit them a couple times in a row or why my character would sometimes leap forward and do a different attack from the one that I was trying to use. So yeah, the attempt at guiding the player towards understanding the game better is appreciated. Moving forward, shortly after stepping into the open world, we are gonna run into the first optional miniboss of the game, the Tree Sentinel. I really like this miniboss here because it teaches two fundamental concepts that you're gonna need to apply during your entire playthrough. The first concept is that it is not mandatory. You're not required to defeat this miniboss in order to progress. If you feel like you're not ready to fight him, you can always avoid him, explore the open world, become stronger and come back to him. And even when it comes to the mandatory bosses that you need to defeat to complete the game, this concept also applies due to the open world nature of it. And the amount of side content that it presents to the player. The second concept is that even when you are underleveled and under-equipped to face a particular opponent, you can still defeat them by exploding their weaknesses. And so, in order to drive this point home, and to a certain extent just because I want to showcase how much of a gamer sack I possess, I'm gonna be taking on the Tree Sentinel right after coming out of the tutorial area, and I'll be defeating him first try. Now let's roll. At a first glance, the Tree Sentinel might appear as a very intimidating opponent due to the wide variety of attacks that he can use. Sometimes you'll try to punish one of his attacks after you dodged once, and he'll follow up immediately with another attack the moment you begin to approach him, and he will hit you, dealing a significant amount of damage. You're gonna notice that a lot of enemies do that in this game. They bait you with one of their attacks and react with a follow up the moment you try to get close to them, depending on how far away you are. So that, on top of being underprepared to, to take a few hits from this enemy without uh, dying, might make this fight quite tricky for me to overcome. However, Tree Sentinel has one major flaw in his moveset that I can exploit to defeat him soundly. Whenever you disengage from him and create some distance, he's gonna do this attack where he charges at you and tries to smack you with his weapon. This attack has a long startup animation that makes it very easy to read, and whenever he finishes using this attack, he stays put for like 3 whole seconds, providing a huge opportunity to deal him free damage. So my strategy for this fight is to remain away from him so he uses his charge attack as, as often as possible, and the moment I see him prepping to do the move, I'm gonna run backwards so I can get out of his attack range and be in place to punish his recovery animation after the charge. And just by doing this, I'm easily able to defeat this otherwise formidable adversary that outclasses me in every aspect. And just like I was able to defeat this boss, it's possible to defeat all the other bosses in the game by applying this strategy. There is always gonna be a way for you to turn the tides in your favor during combat and against bosses. You'll just have to get creative sometimes and look for the right opening. Okay, so after defeating the Tree Sentinel, a little farther ahead, we will find the Church of Elay. 
or Ele, or AJ. I don't know, something like that. And this is a very important location in the game because not only will you find a merchant that sells a very useful item in here, this is also the place where you can activate the easy mode. Let me explain. In this location there is a checkpoint and in this game you can use a checkpoint to fast the travel. So after heading a little more farther ahead you're gonna find another checkpoint where a cutscene will play out, you're gonna get a horse to traverse the open world and after getting your pony, if you fast travel back to the checkpoint in the church of LA, you're gonna have this special interaction with this blue doll four-armed girl that will give you the spirit calling bell. And here is the interesting part. What this item does is that it allows you to summon NPC companions that will help you out in battle. Normally, when it comes to combat, you would have to go out there solo and spend some time figuring out how to defeat the opponents that you will find throughout the game. You would have to find their weaknesses, learn their attack patterns and handle all of their aggression on your own. But when you use the spirit bell and you get a companion helping you out during the fight, the dynamic of the game changes drastically. Now you can have have your companion draw all the attention from the boss while you hit them from behind without having to worry too much about getting hit yourself. And depending on the type of enemy that you are fighting, you might even be able to jump your opponent with the help of your companion and stun lock them indefinitely. There is a whole list of different companions that you'll be able to unlock and use in battle the more you progress into the game. That means, of course, that some companions are going to be more powerful and helpful than others. Later into the game, you'll even be able to summon companions so strong that they will be capable of taking down bosses on their own. So as you can imagine, this this item makes the game considerably easier to beat and that's why it's called the easy mode. And that's pretty much what the easy mode of Elden Ring is about. So here's a question that I've heard being asked a lot. Is there anything wrong with a Dark Souls game having an easy mode? The answer is simple, absolutely nothing. This is a game that requires a lot of memorization and attention to detail. And some people might not have the time to memorize the attack patterns of a boss for 3 hours straight but they still might be interested in other aspects of the experience that this game offers. Be it exploration, the scenery, the story and whatnot. And some other people are just not cut out for these type of games. So there's nothing wrong with giving players that might have issues adapting to the Vanilla Dark Souls experience a way of having an easier time with it. However, if you are someone who has been in the Elden Ring hype train since day one, and you have been following closely the reception that the game has gotten over the past almost two years, it's possible that you've seen some individuals arguing that the spirit calling bell is actually not an easy mode but an intended mechanic and that the enemies and bosses in this game were made with the idea of you using the bell, which putting it blandly is complete nonsense. Just like I showed before with the first miniboss, all the enemies in this game can be defeated playing solo as long as you know what you're doing. The people entertaining this idea of the combat being balanced around you having an NPC companion just uh, don't know how to play a Dark Souls game and have no idea what they're talking about. Period. One thing that I would have to criticize about this mode is the way you have to get it. Like, why does it have to be this complicated to enable a feature that is meant to help new players or players that struggle with the combat? They did something similar with the hard mode in Sekiro. In Sekiro, if you wanted to have a more challenging experience with the game, you would have to first speak like four times in a row with an NPC at the beginning of the game to get an item. Then you would have to get past the tutorial area and then you would have to speedrun your way to a very specific location in order to grab another item and you can't help but wonder why. Why does it have to be like this? Why just not put an option in the main menu or at the very start of the game that allows you to play with the additional features that these items give? I guess it's because uh, it is the From Software way of doing things. They want to feel like unique and special, but uh, I just find this stuff to be so dumb. They could have very well just added an item pickup at the start or after the scripted death sequence that gives you the spirit bell and they could have explained how it works in the tutorial area. Instead of all this nonsense about moving to a checkpoint, then moving to another, then having to wait for a cutscene to play out and so on and so forth. The way From Software implements these things is just so unnecessary and such a waste of time. I've seen some unfortunate cases of people who aren't very 
very skilled at Dark Souls games that they decided to play Elden Ring, but they never went back to the Church of LA at the beginning and missed the, the special interaction with the doll girl, and therefore, they didn't get the bell and had an infernal experience at the beginning of the game. And when you see cases like those, it makes you wonder, why does it have to be like this? Anyways, after getting the bell and your horse, you're pretty much set to explore the open world and gear up to beat the campaign areas. So now I wanna talk about the playstyles that you can go for in this game. In Elden Ring, there are basically two playstyles. You either arm yourself with light and heavy weapons and face your opponents in close quarters, or you learn magic and take down your enemies from afar. There are some who claim that magic in this game is overpowered and that melee combat pales in comparison to how effective magic is, but I would like to disagree with that point of view. A lot of the melee weapons are capable of doing huge amounts of damage with their special moves or by imbuing them with busted status effects. In my opinion, both magic and melee melee approaches are equally viable, but I'm gonna be going with melee weapons for my playthrough because I personally find uh, the hit and run or downright just spam from a distance playstyle that magic promotes extremely fucking boring. Alright, when it comes to playing melee weapons, there are three things that you must have with you at all times. Those being a light weapon, a heavy weapon and a shield. You want to use light weapons for fast enemies and enemies that can't be stacked by your heavy weapons. Heavy weapons give you a huge advantage against light and heavy enemies that aren't very fast and that can't super armor through the attacks of your light weapons. And shields are simply a necessity in this game. You're gonna run into enemies that will punish you heavily for not blocking, because they are gonna have huge delays and tracking properties on their attacks and it's gonna be extremely difficult to dodge those. There are also three types of shields, small, medium and heavy. Whenever you're going for a shield in this this game there are three crucial stats that you always have to pay attention to. Those are physical damage negation, guard boost and weight. Physical damage negation determines whether you will take damage or not after blocking a melee attack or a projectile. Your shield should always have a physical negation of 100 or else it will get you killed at some point. Guard boost determines how much stamina you will lose after blocking an attack. The higher the number, the less stamina you will lose. And wait, make sure not to equip a shield that is too heavy or else it will cause you a lot of trouble. I'll talk more in detail about this later. Medium and heavy shields, in my opinion, are the way to go. They offer the most damage negation and a guard boost. Most small shields have low damage negation, which means that even after successfully blocking an attack, you'll still take damage in most cases. These shields are more suited for parrying because apparently they have bigger parry windows from what I've heard, but I just wouldn't recommend going for parries in this game because there are many attacks that cannot be parried, and Elden Ring is one of those games where there is no clear distinction between what can be parried and what cannot. So if you wanna go for parries, you're gonna have to do lots of trial and error trying to find out what you can get away with, and you're also gonna have to memorize a lot more stuff, which is gonna become a tedious in the long run. Okay, we have talked about playstyles and strategies so far, so I think it's now time to talk about the gameplay itself. Elden Ring's gameplay at its core is pure exploration and combat, with some platform and puzzle solving in between. Let's begin by talking about the most important aspect, the combat. The combat in Elden Ring is all about keeping your head cool, understanding when to go in, and making each one of your moves count. There is usually not much room for improvisation during combat in Dark Souls games, there is no animation cancelling, your strong attacks have a huge startup and recovery frames, and uh, most of the useful actions are heavily restricted by a stamina bar. This same set of rules also apply to Elden Ring, so you gotta be very careful and methodical with what you do. Now let's see what the player can do in Elden Ring. You have light and heavy attacks, you can jump and you also have different light and heavy attacks when jumping, you can sprint and you get a different light and heavy moves when sprinting as well, you can crouch for stealth purposes and uh, there is also a variation of the light attack when crouching, you can roll and backdash for dodging purposes, there is also a backdash attack, and you can block and dual wield two weapons of the same type, you can perform a counter maneuver 
better by pressing the strong attack button after blocking an enemy attack. You can use special skills that are present in almost every weapon. You can use items and cycle between 11 of them at a time. You can swap between 3 different weapons on each hand. And you can't uh, two hand any of your weapons to do additional damage. You can fight on horseback too, but most of the time it's far more effective to fight on foot. The pony is uh, used more than anything for traversal and exploring the open world. But anyways, there is a good variety of actions that you can perform during combat since the get-go. It all comes down to using the right move at the right time. Alright, that would do it for the combat at the moment. Let me talk about the exploration aspect now. To put it simple, the exploration in Elden Ring is superb. The level design is uh, remarkably creative with all sorts of secrets hidden throughout the open world. There are lots of platforming sections that will get your heart racing when trying to traverse them, and the hidden locations that will even play tricks on your mind and make you believe that you've already explored a room when you are in a completely different one. These type of locations were my favorite by the way. And so when we put all these elements together we get a game that feels uh, really solid, that is very engaging and that makes you look forward to what you're gonna be running into next. Elden Ring starts off uh, really well. Once you figure out what the game is about and you come up with an effective approach to it, you'll find yourself having a great time taking on the challenges and discovering the secrets that the lands between have prepared for you. So what's the issue with Elden Ring? Where does it go wrong? Why could it possibly be considered a mid-game when we have already seen all that it has to offer for exploration and how many options it gives to the player during combat? Well, I would say that the problem starts where it begins. The excitement that you get out of playing Elden Ring for the first 15 hours or so just doesn't last long. The first thing that I would like to criticize about this game is the gameplay progression. The gameplay, especially the combat, never moves into any interesting direction. It remains exactly the same from beginning to end. Just to provide more context as to what I mean with gameplay progression, I'm gonna be showing a few clips of other games and uh, you're gonna see how the gameplay looks in those games at the start and how it looks later after some progression has been done. And then we're gonna do the same for Elden Ring of course and compare. So let's begin by checking Neo 2 first. <laughs> Now let's see God of War Ragnarok. And now let's see Sekiro.
as it can be appreciated, in these games there is a big difference in how the gameplay looks at the beginning and how it looks at the end, because there is actual gameplay progression in them. The further you go into any of these games, the stakes get higher and higher, and the gameplay becomes more challenging and demanding. So in order to allow the player a chance to keep up with the ever-raising pace and difficulty, these games introduce additional mechanics and uh, numerous upgrades to the moveset of your characters throughout a playthrough that provide the player with the means to face the ever-growing odds that the game presents. Gameplay progression is such a beautiful concept, dude. It's a huge factor in any game when it comes to keeping the player engaged and uh, looking forward to whatever is next. Not to mention that it's also a crucial element that allows the player more room for improvisation and experimentation. And in general, it's something that also helps with having the player coming back to the game when all it's said and done. Now let's check some clips for Elden Ring and see how the gameplay progression looks in this game. There is absolutely no gameplay progression in Elden Ring. The game never evolves or moves forward from the basic actions that you're taught at the tutorial. And keep in mind that this is an insanely long game. Your first playthrough can very well take up to 100 hours of playtime. Mine took 120. The gameplay of Elden Ring is just uh, so goddamn repetitive. You're gonna see yourself doing the same three things over and over. Either you face in battle a boss that is fast and cannot be staggered by hitting them just once or twice with your light attacks, before having to roll away from a 7-piece attack pattern. Rinse and repeat until the boss is dead. Or you're gonna be spamming the hell out of the heavy jump attack with a heavy weapon to stand lock and bully a poor soul that doesn't have enough super armor to tank your hits. Or you might as well use a weapon with an overpower skill, in which case uh, you'll see yourself just spamming the overpower skill most of the time. This monotony and repetitiveness in the gameplay is a byproduct of how unbalanced the game is. A moment ago I talked about all the actions that you could perform during combat, right? Well, it turns out that in reality most of those actions are irrelevant because they simply just aren't good. Heavy attacks are very situational because they need to be charged. And charging them up usually takes a lot of time. Time that will turn you into a sitting duck because you can't cancel out of an animation in this game. If you don't charge up your heavy attacks, they are pretty much a waste of stamina because they will still come out slow, but will do reduce damage and have less stagger capabilities. So a much more convenient alternative is to just use your jump heavy attacks, which come out a lot faster, have the same stagger capabilities, abilities uh, as a fully charged heavy and uh, do around the same damage as well. It's the same for sprinting attacks. There is not really any use to sprinting towards an enemy and hitting them with one of these attacks when you can just uh, sprint towards the enemy, then jump and use a heavy attack in the air, which will give you more damage, more stagger potential and better range. 
The crouching attacks that also function as dodge attacks, because they come out automatically if you try to attack right away after performing a roll, have what's arguably the worst tracking in the entire game. Most of the time when you try to roll towards the flank of an enemy and punish them after a properly timed dodge, you'll end up having a crouching attack coming out instead that is going to completely miss the mark on the enemy. The tracking on these moves are absolutely abysmal, not to mention that they also do less damage than a regular light attack, so you're never gonna want to use these moves unless uh, you're playing PvP. But on PvE, you're much better off just delaying a little bit your attacks after a roll so you can get a regular light attack instead of the crouching one. Then we have the backdash and the backdash attacks. What? What's this shit even for? Look, I never played the Dark Souls games, but besides Elden Ring, I have also played Bloodborne. And I have seen quite a few gameplays of Dark Souls 3. And in those games, this backdash nonsense is also present. I swear to God, folks, I have seen plenty of other people play these games and never before I have witnessed a single player that uses this stuff. The backdash is just uh, so useless. There is not a single reason to use this over the roll dodge. If you have ever seen someone use this in any way that makes sense, please let me know in the comments. I need to see that because, seriously, why does From Software keep implementing this useless garbage in their games? Backdashes serve zero purpose. They should delete themselves now. So in the end, when it comes down to practicality, you're only gonna be using the same two or three moves during combat, which are light attack, jump attacks, a few guard counters here and there, and the ashes of war or special moves on your weapons. And even when it comes to jump attacks, I've seen myself only using the heavy version most of the time, since it is the one that does the most damage and the one that has the most stagger potential, which adds even more to the lack of variety during combat. The combat moveset is not the only aspect of the game that is unbalanced. In this game, there is a huge variety of weapons. There are like 15 different weapon types, and each weapon type has like 20 variations or different skins, and weapons are also also divided in two categories, somber and regular. The majority of weapon types feel like one of the many attempts from the developers in making you think there is a lot of substance to this game when in reality all that there is to it is just an inflated number of the same thing that you have already seen before. I say this because despite having all these uh, different weapon types, they all play the same. You have great swords, great axes, great hammers, colossal weapons, and all you ever do with those is spam jump heavy. Then you have the swords, scimitars, axes, daggers, fist weapons and whatnot, and all you ever do with those is spam light attack. I swear to god that I'm not exaggerating this. After finishing the game and hoarding a bunch of different weapons in my inventory, I went into the new game plus and played a few extra hours trying out all these different weapon types to see if I was missing on something and uh, dude, they all play exactly the same. The only weapon type that feels somewhat different from the others is the spear and the trusting swords, because uh, these ones have a special mechanic where they allow you to attack while blocking with a shield, which is ridiculously overpowered by the way. But other than that, uh, it's just the same fucking thing plastered all over the weapon menu 7 or 8 times, which is crazy. There is more variety when it comes to Ashes of War, the special moves on your weapons, of course, but whatever weapon skill that is not some sort of short range melee attack that launches enemies into the air or knocks them down, or a busted long range move that hits enemies through walls or tracks them down to the end of the earth, is usually not a good Ash of War either. But I digress, I kinda went on a tangent there for a moment speaking about how monotone and repetitive the weapon system also is because uh, that's not even the point that I was trying to make. I was originally talking about uh, the balance issues, right? Well, despite most weapon types playing the same, the factor that plays a big role in determining which weapons are gonna be good and which ones are gonna be bad is the somber and regular categories. The somber weapons are these uh, super ultra badass weapons that can only be upgraded using somber smithing stones. You mainly get uh, these weapons by completing secret dungeons or defeating bosses. But here is the thing. 
You can't change the ashes of war in these weapons nor imbue them with special attributes. Whereas for the regular weapons that are upgraded with regular smithing stones, you can customize their ashes of war aka special moves and imbue them with special attributes by finding whetstones that can be found by exploring the open world and going to a checkpoint. Doing this drastically increases your damage output by either customizing your weapons with a powerful ash of war or by imbuing them with powerful attributes like frostbite and bleed. Time for an anecdote here. The first time that I played this game, after defeating one of the very first bosses, Gadric, I didn't know any better and I decided to go with his weapon, which was a somber one, and arguably one of the worst weapons in the game. I tried the Ash of War which was very slow and most enemies would just uh, dodge it or interrupt you when using it. And then at some point I wanted to try the items that allow you to imbue weapons with attributes for a short period of time. Just to realize a moment after that for some reason I couldn't even use those items in this weapon. I didn't think much of it at the beginning. I thought that it was a silly bug or that I didn't meet a stat requirement to use those items. So I just kept going. The thing with Elden Ring is that you kinda have to take a decision early on and stick to a couple weapons because the upgrade items are pretty scarce. So that means that if you want to try new weapons later on, you either are going to be fighting with under level equipment for a while, or you'll have to go to a mine and farm upgrade items for hours on end. And fuck that in all honesty. There is nothing more boring than farming or grinding in a game. But anyways, I kept going with the Samber weapon. I was being able to get through the game without much struggle. I was defeating most bosses first try, although some fights were taking quite a bit of time. But then I reached the end game and I encountered what I call the Trinity of M which are three endgame bosses whose names start all by M, like Maliket, Mog, and Melania. These are three of the toughest bosses in the game. They have a bajillion health, they hit like a track, and they have special moves that make them very tricky and frustrating to deal with. And basically, fighting any of these three bosses is a race at killing them before they kill you. And my summer weapon was just not cutting it against these guys. So after being stuck for hours on end against each of these bosses, I had to part ways with my Samber weapon and try something else. Luckily at this point in the game where you have to fight these three fuckers, you have access to plenty of resources to upgrade weapons quickly. Although you still have to do a little grinding here and there, but anyways, fast forward a few hours, I now have on me two regular weapons maxed out, one on each hand imbued with frostbite and bleed, I go for a rematch with the trinity of M, and I pretty much melt each of them in two minutes without having to put a lot of effort in it. The difference in damage between these three weapons that are actually of the same type is just perplexing. And I can't help but wonder why is the difference this big. Why is the other weapon that I had been using during my entire first playthrough so bad? Why are these other two so good? I just couldn't help but feel like I was playing the game in the wrong way the entire time. And it just feels like this for a lot of weapons and ashes of war in the game. You have some hella bastard somber weapons with hella bastard ashes of war like the Bloodhound's Fang or Rivers of Blood that everyone and their moms use for a reason. And then you have trash like the Axe of Gadric or the Veteran's Prosthesis that only have looks going for them and could never hope to hold a candle to any regular weapon in build with frostbite or bleed. And speaking about weapon attributes like frostbite and bleed, that's another aspect of the game that feels unbalanced as hell. In this game, just like with the weapon types, there are a lot of attributes. You have fire, flames, lightning, magic, holy, poison, scarlet rot, bleed, frostbite, a whole lot. And with all these elements and attributes, uh, you would think that, that there is a lot of different stuff that you can pull off depending on what you decide to go for. Well, not really, because the only thing each one of these attributes do is increase your damage depending on the enemy you're fighting. So for what enemies you use each attribute, I don't know and you will probably never know either. In Sekiro there were also a bunch of attributes and elements that you could use in your weapons and uh, they all had some kind of special effect that made them unique from each other. Fire would temporarily stop the post-regeneration on enemies. Lightning would momentarily paralyze enemies in place. 
Poison would start uh, draining the health of your opponents. Divine would increase the damage of your melee attacks and allow you to hurt phantom enemies. Blood would increase the speed and range of your melee attacks. They all felt like they served a specific and unique purpose and uh, could be used in many creative ways. In Elden Ring, like I said, that's all thrown off the window and uh, all this stuff is just meant to do more damage. But now there are too many attributes and there are too many different enemy types. And the game doesn't put any effort into actually letting you know who you should be using each attribute on. There was a very similar system to this one in Bloodburn, but in that game it worked because there were only two attributes and only three enemy types. And the game made it clear from the get-go who you should be using one of those attributes on. I think you are told in a cutscene or a dialogue with an NPC very early on that beasts are weak to fire. And from there you can assume that lightning affects demigods and humans the most. In Elden Ring I could only figure out after two playthroughs that fire does a lot of damage on plant enemies like the avatars and the big ass flowers and that lightning is somewhat effective against the uh, Astel natural god of the darkness or whatever his name is but other than that I could never understand what magic is used for what holy is used for what the difference between fire and flames is poison is kinda useless if you don't mix it up with scarlet rod scarlet rod uh, cannot be imbued to weapons and you can only get it on very specific items and magic spells and then you have uh, frostbite and bleed that pretty much make all of the other attributes useless. These two attributes are by far the best in the game. What they do is that they remove a big chunk of an enemy's health bar when you fill up a meter after hitting the enemy several times. And oh my god, these things just melt everything. Most enemies in the game are vulnerable to either one or the other, if not both. So you don't really have to go out of your way to do trial and error trying to figure out what you need to use for on a specific type of enemy. And they just do so much damage, especially if you use them together, that there is no point in even considering using any of the other attributes when you can use these two instead. This is yet another example of the developers putting lots of stuff in this game only to inflate the numbers and make it seem like it has a lot of depth when in reality everything is the same shit with a different color. Or it's so poorly balanced that it becomes irrelevant for the most part. The talismans in my opinion are the most interesting system in the game and the one that feels the most balanced as well. The talismans are items that you can discover exploring the open world and they grant you special bonuses when you equip them like increasing your stamina bar or your health bar or making your ashes of war do more damage. That kind of stuff. You can equip up to 4 of them at a time and granted they don't really do much. Like the bonuses that you get out of them are very minor increases. But it's fun in a way to experiment with them and find out which is the best setup for your build. Of course, there are some talismans that give more useful bonuses than others too, but again, the increases that you get out of these items are so small that it feels properly balanced for the most part. There are however a few other systems that I feel are flawed or poorly implemented. Let me start by talking about the weight and armor systems first. The armor system is pretty much just a decoration to once again make the game look like it has a lot of depth and substance going for it. When you go to the armor menu, you'll see all these numbers plastered all around the screen. And what does all of this stuff mean? Well, to put it simple, it means absolutely nothing. It's just a bunch of bollocks. You can disregard all the information being shown to you on screen and just go by the weight of the armors alone. The higher the weight, the higher the damage reduction that you'll get out of it. Of course, that would be the case if there was any actual damage reduction to speak of. But in reality, armors in this game are just cosmetics. It doesn't matter if you use the armor with the lowest weight or the heaviest armor in the game. The difference in damage that you will receive is so minimal that you're better off just going all the way for low weight equipment so you can increase your chances of getting the lightweight status, which will give you increased dodge distance and iframes when rolling. But other than that, just go with whatever looks appealing to your eyes while making sure you don't go heavyweight, because that's gonna increase your recovery frames and when rolling and also reduce your dodge distance, which is a big no-no in this game. 
On a side note, I can't help but wonder what's even the point of this game having a weight system once you see how ineffective heavy armor is, and armor being the one thing that influences your weight the most. Again, another example of the developers just cramming this game up with unnecessary stuff to make it look more profound and deeper than it really is. Another system that I find terribly implemented is the crafting system. In this game you can craft items at any moment on the inventory menu, but the whole nature of this system just feels extremely grindy. A lot of the useful items that you can craft require excessive amounts of materials in order to be crafted, and materials that you'll find so infrequently unless that you go out of your way and go to a specific location to farm the aforementioned material for hours on end. A good example of this would be the third material needed to craft any of these four items that I'm hovering over on screen right now. I want you to picture this. At this point I'm on New Game Plus and after completing the game once while doing a fair amount of exploration and never using the crafting feature beforehand, I was only able to find 8 pieces of this material. So if I gather more of the other materials required to craft this stuff, that means that I will be able to craft any of these items 8 times, before having to do another whole playthrough worth of exploration to get a few more strings. The amount of grind and farming that they expect you to do in order to use this system consistently is just uh, so insane. Next, I wanna talk about the Great Runes system. Great Runes are items that you get after defeating some of the main bosses in the game. Once you get one of these, you can go to a specific location that allows you to activate it, and then you can use a rune arc from your inventory to gain its special effects. I have two major problems with this system. The first one is that the game takes away all of your great runes when you start a new game plus run. So that means that if you wanna use a specific great rune after beating the game once, you have to go out of your way and defeat again the boss that has the great rune you want to use. And this is even worse when you realize that some of the bosses that drop the great runes are locked behind the progression walls. So that means you'll have to replay the game for hours on end in order to get back some of the great runes you previously acquired. There are even two great runes that you get from two of the final bosses of the game. Which begs the question, what's even the point of giving you these items when you get them at a point where the game is pretty much over and you can't carry them over to New Game Plus? Another problem that I have with this system is that uh, you lose the effects of the great runes on death. Look, you can tell me to get good and all that nonsense, but dying in this game is not exactly a rare occurrence. An enemy can hit you and push you off an edge, or a boss can one-shot you if they are in a bad mood. You can die at any moment, and once you die, you have to use another rune arc to recall the powers of the great rune, and rune arcs are an extremely rare item in this game. So that means that you get very limited chances to use the effects of your great rune. I think they should remain active despite dying. One more system that I find faulty, although this is not really a big deal, you could even call it a nitpick from my part, is the item swap system. In this game you can go to your inventory and equip up to 10 items at a time and cycle between them. And if you hold the triangle, provided you're playing on a PS5 controller by the way, you get access to 4 additional shortcuts. These 4 additional shortcuts when holding down triangle are a pretty cool and useful thing, but the problem is in the other 10 item slots that you equip from your inventory. In theory, it sounds very useful to have this many slots to use items during combat, but in practice, it just becomes a mess. Here's an example, I currently have my hidden potions equipped on my item slot, but I wanna throw some knives at my enemies so I swap from my potions to my knives. But then I get hit and I need to heal, so now I have to run away and awkwardly mash the down arrow on my controller 10 times while avoiding the enemies in order to cycle back to my potions. But oh no! I made a mistake and pressed the down arrow one more time than required, so I skipped the potions slot and now I have to mash the down arrow 10 more times in order to cycle back to them. It's nice that they want to give you the option to carry all these items on you during combat, but realistically, you will only be able to carry 2 or 3 before it becomes a hindrance to swap between items. Ok, now I wanna talk about a few aspects of the combat that I don't find the most amusing to say the least. The first thing would be the enemy stand locks and delays. In this game there are 3 ways in which your character gets staggered after being hit by an enemy. 
I'm gonna call these three forms of staggering, light stagger, heavy stagger and knockdown. Light stagger is when you get hit and any action you might be performing gets interrupted, but you can move and block right away after being interrupted. Then there is the heavy stagger where your character gets interrupted on any action and remains a stand for a period of time. And then there are the knockdowns where very self-explanatorily your character gets laid down on the ground. So the thing is, whenever you get heavy staggered or knocked down, you're not allowed to do anything but roll. Pressing the roll button allows you to get out of the heavy staggered or knocked down animations faster. But other than that, you're a sitting duck waiting to be hit again if you don't press the roll button. But a lot of enemies in this game, especially the bosses, are designed in such a way that most of their attacks will either heavy stagger you or knock you down. And then the next attack that they do is timed in such a way that it will hit you if you press the roll button to be able to move as soon as possible. This is a 100% done in purpose by From Software because a lot of enemies do the same thing where they hit you once, you get staggered or knocked down, and then they put you in this uh, loophole of trying to move and getting hit only to get staggered again until you get hit three or four times in a row and you die. I find this to be so obnoxious. In this game you can carry an astonishing amount of 14 healing items at a time, when you get all the upgrades for your potions, but most of the time, especially against late game bosses, you end up having to use only 2 or 3 during the entire fight, and if you die, it's because the boss either one-shotted you or put you in an infinite loophole of staggers and delayed attacks. And whenever that happens, it just feels like such cheap garbage. Elden Ring is a very memorization-heavy game. Memorization in this game is your best ally if you want to play on anything that is not the easy mode. And since bosses behave in this way, it adds an additional layer of memorization where you have to memorize the timing in which you are supposed to roll away from each individual attack of a boss if you get hit by them. And I find that to be so damp. Something similar also happens when you get grabbed, and again, mostly against bosses. Getting grabbed in this game usually means that you're about to take a fuck ton of damage. And when this happens, on top of losing 70% of your health or more, your lock on feature breaks. You end up knocked down most of the time, and before your character can even begin standing up, the boss is already letting out another 7 piece combo. And since your lock on got disabled during the grab animation, what happens next is that your character stands up facing backwards and showing his back to the enemy, which in turn causes you to keep getting hit and die. It's just a, such an overkill. And again, it feels so fucking cheap and unfair. An enemy should have no business raiding another chain of attacks right after hitting the player with an unblockable move that is capable of tracking to the end of the air and that does an absurd amount of damage. And we obviously can't forget to talk about the camera. Like I said before, I didn't play any of the Dark Souls games, so I can't comment on how the camera behaves in those. But I have played Blood Bonner, Sekiro, and Elden Ring, and uh, Jesus Christ, the camera is just as crappy as I remember it. Is it like a from software tradition to make enemies that don't even fit the screen and make the camera spin and zoom in to annoy the player as much as possible or something? You have to look no farther than at any fight against the Three Spirits, or any dragon encounter in Faru Masula, or any dead right bird to see how much of a mess the camera can become in this game. Not much else to comment here. Let's just say that quite often the camera is less than ideal. A few other aspects of the game that I have to criticize would be the stealth. The stealth in this game is just a far cry of what it was in Sekiro, where you had plenty of tools to stalk your prey and you could ambush your opponents from all directions and heights. Stealth in Elden Ring doesn't go beyond crouching and hiding in a bash, to get an enemy with a fatal strike from behind, that quite often won't even guarantee you a kill. Which once again leaves me wondering, what's even the point of this stuff being in the game? Which is kind of a silly question, because at this point we already know that it's to cram the game up with as much useless and irrelevant and stuff as possible to make it look deep. Now I said very early on that I would speak about this later and here I am. 
half an hour into the video later finally coming back to this point but hey better later than never right so we have the new game plus mode which is a start over with everything you obtained and unlocked in the previous playthrough except the great runes for some fucking reason and stronger enemies and bosses that offer a more challenging experience or at least that's what i wish it was despite enemies gaining more health and damage when going into the new game plus mode they simply don't stand a chance against your fully upgraded weapons from the end game of your previous playthrough the enemy scaling is so poorly implemented that none of the opponents of the early or mid game sections are gonna pose a threat to you and your busted ass plus 25 and the plus 10 weapons you'll only find a slightly more challenging version of the enemies that you face at the end game areas but other than that you're gonna be steam rolling everything until you reach the mountain tops of the giants it's baffling to me that they messed up the new game plus mode this badly in elden ring when previously in blood boner they made an excellent job at making all enemies in all sections of the game feel like they were scaled up to present a challenge to your fully upgraded character and gear on the new game plus in elden ring it's far more challenging to just start a fresh new save and fight all the bosses from the early areas again than fighting them on new game plus which is nothing short of absurd and speaking about scaling i wish elden ring had some kind of in-game option like in witcher 3 where you can make all enemies in all areas become stronger the more you level up elden ring is a huge game and you can miss a lot of stuff when exploring certain areas and quite often when you decide to come back to those areas to check up anything you left behind you'll find yourself being ridiculously over leveled and annihilating everything that stands in your way without much effort which kind of ruins the whole purpose of exploring and discovering new challenges now i've seen some discussion about the enemy variation in elden ring being bad some people seem to think that there is too much enemy repetition and i have to disagree with this the enemy variation in elden ring is all right i don't think it's necessary to have 20 new enemies on every area or hidden location like uh, no game ever has done that there is always gonna be enemy repetition to some extent in any game what matters most is how well the game cycles between each enemy and i think elden ring does this fairly well a lot of enemies that are introduced as bosses at the beginning reappear later as regular enemies and the gaming gradually introduces more new enemies while mixing them up with some of the ones that you have already fought it's cool and the last thing that I think would be worth mentioning about this game would be the story. Look, I'm not gonna sit here and criticize the story for the way it is told, and I'm not going to pretend the story had a big impact in the way I ended up feeling about the game because that would be a huge lie. I'm a sucker for games like Doom Eternal or Neo that also have super disjointed narratives with a lot of elements that are open to interpretation and whatnot. Just like in Elden Ring, and I didn't have a problem with the way the story was in those games Either. I am of the mindset that uh, your criteria for judging a game should mainly be the gameplay elements. The story is always the secondary because what matters the most in a game is the enjoyment that you get out of playing the game, not from watching a cutscene or a cinematic. So at the end of the day, I didn't care much for the story, I honestly didn't understand what it was about. There was an encyclopedia worth of lore in the descriptions of every item in the game, but I just couldn't be bothered to read all of that stuff if there was something i would have to criticize about the story it would be the characters i feel like a lot of the characters could have had more screen time and uh, could have played a more active role in the narrative i would like to make my case here comparing the two big old guys from sekiro and elden ring the owl and Gatri. In Sekiro, we are first introduced to the Owl during the opening cutscene, where we see him pondering on whether he should kill the protagonist or not. In the end, he decides not to kill the protagonist, and instead it takes him in to train him into the ninja arts. Then a few hours later, we have another interaction with him, where we see him die after the castle he was supposed to protect is attacked by an unknown enemy. But then it turns out that the Owl is one of the bad guys, and he was the perpetrator of the attack on the castle, 
all along. So he kills the protagonist, the protagonist later revives and meets the owl again much later into the game. And then there is another interaction with him where he, as the adoptive father of the protagonist, orders the protagonist to submit and follow his orders. And then the player gets to make a decision where you can refuse to follow his orders or submit to him. And depending on the choice that you make, you get to see some cutscenes that give you a lot of insight into the owl's character, like his ambitions, his emotions and his motivations, which is all great character development. And on top of all that, there is also a lot of hidden lore written about him in the item descriptions in pure firm software style. Then we have Godfrey, whom we see being mentioned in the opening cutscene of Elden Ring for like two seconds. Then at the very end of the game, we finally get to meet him and the first thing he does is throw in a monologue on how much he wants to become the lord of all the lands or something. And then he aggros us, so we kick his ass and then he gets angry, rips his shirt and kills his cat. And then he decides his name is not Godfrey anymore. He now wants to be called uh, who relax the... WARRIOR! Or some shit like that, and then I decide that I've had enough of the ramblings of this drunk old man. So I send him to the afterlife, and that's all we get to see of Godfrey, the first cringe lord. So you see how differently both characters are handled, despite both of them being very prominent characters in their respective stories? The Owl is a great From Software character. Godfrey sucks. Another example that I have of this is Moog. This guy has a super cool design. He sounds like he has a frog stuck in his throat. Welcome, honored guest, to the birthplace of our dynasty. And has this malevolent aura all around him. And if you know about his lore, you know he's pretty fucked up in the head. He's a really interesting character that would make for a pretty good villain, but unfortunately all we ever get to see from him is a 60 seconds cutscene where he climbs up from a pool of blood, says some weird stuff, then he dies and we never hear from him again. These characters feel like a lot of wasted potential in all honesty. And just like Godfrey and Moog, a lot of the other characters in Elden Ring, if not all of them, feel like they were executed in a lazy and an interesting way like this. I feel like the narrative and the open world setting could have benefited greatly from giving the most prominent characters more screen time and more relevancy to the plot instead of just being a bunch of guys that you speak to for two minutes and never see again or you just straight kill them. I would comment on the music as well but music is a super subjective matter at the end of the day so I'll just say that the soundtrack is definitely an improvement over Blood Bonner, where pretty much there was no music outside the boss arenas and the hub area, but I still didn't like it in general. There are some good songs here and there, but whatever that doesn't feel like a ridiculously overdramatic opera is a gloomy tune that makes me sleepy most of the time. Alright folks, that's gonna be the end of the video for this time. Uh, give me a second, I need to read my script. Uh, I want to apologize in advance to anyone who watched me play this game on stream. Sorry if this review isn't what you were expecting. I tried to have fun with this game, I tried to enjoy it, I tried to love it, but I just couldn't. I just find too many issues and stuff that doesn't make sense in it. Especially with all the different systems that the game tries to handle but that doesn't quite do it in a proper way. And with how repetitive and monotone the gameplay feels. The exploration is by far the best element that this game has to offer, but in my opinion, exploration is only a one-time deal. You've done it once, uh, you've done it all. So that doesn't really give me much of a motive to continue playing the game either. So could it be possible that with the upcoming DLC for Elden Ring I'll change my mind about this game? Most likely no. I don't think no amount of DLC will fix the gripes that I have about this game. It'll probably double down on the, on some of the elements that I find flawed, like more weapon types that will play exactly as the current ones, more busted weapons and skills that will make the game even more unbalanced, and uh, more bosses that will stand lock you to death or one-shot you. So here is the big question. Would I recommend a game that I consider mediocre? My answer should uh, probably be no. 
But uh, since this is a huge game and the exploration can be somewhat entertaining, I would say only play it uh, if you can get it on sale or pirate it. Nothing more. Definitely don't pay full price for it because it could disappoint you just like it is it like it disappointed me. All right, quickly now. My favorite parts about this game: best male character in Blood Guy. In Blood. In Blood. Most based character in Blood Guy. In Blood. In Blood. Best female character: Anastasia the Tarnished Eater. Please eat me, baby. Funniest character in Blood Guy. In Blood. In Blood. Best waifu in Blood Guy. I mean. Lionel the Lionhearted, best reason to replay the game, in Blood Guy, in Blood, in Blood, best level of the game, Liurnia, because you can find in Blood Guy in there, in Blood, in Blood, best boss, Radagon and Elden Beast, honorable mention to Gatskin Duo, best song, Mog's Team, conclusion, Elden Ring is for gamers, is it a masterpiece? Who cares about that crap? Get it on sale or pirate it out of 10. Like or dislike and subscribe. Busy India.